60. I'm Bruce Bradway. I teach this class. I've taught it for, golly, uh, about 20 years. <laughs> um, I am not in Salie. Uh, I'm not uh, in Arizona. I, this is where I live in Lost Nation, Iowa. Uh, I was on the Salie campus until COVID. And since COVID, I uh, moved back home. And now I teach from, uh, from uh, Lost Nation. Okay, uh, so let's go ahead and talk about how you pass this class. Let me expand this a little bit. There we go. There's Lost Nation. There's my name. Let's get this out of the way. There we go. Okay, so how do we pass the class? Let's go down here. Uh, you've got a textbook. The textbook is Adaba and uh, Cohen's Uppers, Downers, All Arounders. Um, it's, I've been using this for um, about 20 years. Of course, it's been updated since, since I first started using it. But uh, I, I started using it because it was the textbook being used in a substance abuse uh, program in, in um uh, Montana at uh, Salish Kootenai College and it was I've, I found it to be such a good text that uh, I continued using it and uh, that's why we have that textbook okay so it uh, there's ten chapters actually there's only nine chapters in the book but I've added a, uh, a tenth chapter uh, a tenth lecture uh, the last lecture is about uh, psychotropic uh, pharmaceuticals uh, such as Zoloft and, and uh, Xanax and Prozac, uh, the antidepressants and the anti-anxiolytics, uh, um, uh, Halperidol, you know, all of the um, uh, all the drugs that they use, all the pharmaceuticals that they use to treat people who have uh, mental illness. Uh, so each test is 20 points, and there are 10 tests, and that uh, 10 quizzes, one for each chapter, one for each lecture, uh, and that adds up to 200 points. There is a, a paper that you need to write about one of the drugs uh, that, you, that we talk about, uh, either one of the... Um, uh, one of the, with the illegal drugs... Uh, or, well, alcohol is not illegal, and neither is, uh, neither is uh, marijuana in, in uh, 21 states. So <clears throat> you need to write a paper about something, something that uh, deals with drugs, uh, something that deals with the, the, our topic at hand, and that's worth 100 points. And then uh, there will be 10 article critiques, one for each chapter one for each lecture, and that, that's worth 100 points uh, for a total of 400 points. I don't know where the 500 came from. Anyway, looks like somebody can't add and subtract. Yeah, there's 400 points. I guess we just need to change that to four. That's, we can't change it. Okay, anyway, 400 points. Okay, is that all we need to talk about as far as passing the class? So you've got uh, article critiques. Um, article critiques are, are research articles uh, that deal with uh, the topic that we're, that we're talking about. Uh, uppers, downers, all-arounders. We talk about hallucinogens. Uh, we talk about uh, hypnotics. Um, and, of course, the pharmaceutical uh, uh, lecture as well. Okay, so this is me. Uh, that's me, and this is where I live. Uh, if you need to get a hold of me, I have office hours every Monday and Tuesday uh, from 3 to three to 5 Mountain Standard Time. Um, I'm Central Time, so this is actually 4 to 6 as far as I'm concerned, but it's uh, 3 to 5 as far as you're concerned. Uh, if you live in the uh, the uh, Navajo Nation area, um, I also have office hours uh, earlier. If you can't uh, attend between three and five, uh, I have office hours between eight and ten on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Uh, so here's the address for the uh, office hours, uh, and if you click on this. Uh, 
on this, you should go directly to the uh, the office hours. And if I'm online, of course, uh, you'll be able. We will be able to conver converse. I should be online. I usually am fairly fastidious about that. Uh, if you can't uh, do the office hours, then potentially you can communicate with me with my email address. It's right here. Or if worse comes to worse, then you can always call me or text me. Uh, I have to warn you, uh, I don't pay a lot of attention to my telephone, uh, my cell phone. I'm not, I'm not a teenager uh, so, or a millennial. I'm a baby boomer. Uh, so I don't, uh, I didn't grow up with a, a telephone uh, attached to my hand. Uh, so I, I don't really pay that much attention to my text messages. Uh, I can get them, uh, but it, it sometimes will take a little bit longer for me to acknowledge that I, I have a text message. Anyway, so if worse comes to worse, you can always call me. And this is my cell phone number. So there you go. That's... Uh, that's the class. So let's go ahead and get started. Let's go ahead and get started with chapter one. Uh, chapter one is just a, a general, uh, general uh, uh, chapter dealing with with uh, what we're going to be talking about. Pharmacology of addiction. At present, there is a debate going on over the legalization of marijuana. It is now legal in 16 states. Actually, it was. Uh, it's 21 states now, and that includes Arizona, and medical marijuana is only legal in six states. That's not true. 39 states in the union, and this changes with every election because the, uh, the people in the state have to decide whether they want to, uh, it, if they want to keep it as illegal or not. There are 11 states where marijuana is never legal, uh, so you have to be careful. If you, if you are carrying uh, you have to be careful uh, not to drive through those states. Uh, so which states are we talking about? The ones that are uh, where it's illegal, uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Indiana, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina. Let's see, where else? Um, Idaho, Wyoming, Colorado. No, not Colorado. Wyoming, uh, Nebraska, uh, Missouri, and Kansas, I think. In, uh, in Iowa, where I live, it is uh, medical marijuana is legal, but, uh, but not recreational marijuana. So, uh, this is, and this has been a long debate. Um, this is an old picture, as you can see. Look at all the hair on these people, uh, on these guys. <clears throat> um, yeah, and look at, the, look at the age of the car, too. <laughs> The vehicle, that's from the 70s, I think. Anyway, yeah, this has been a long, long, hard struggle. Uh, currently, the drug that seems to be causing the most serious problems is uh, crystal methamphetamine and opiates and opioids, uh, prescription opiates and opioids. Uh, not only are we having trouble with these drugs in North America, but it is causing a crisis in Europe and Asia as well. And these are pictures of individuals who... Um, were on crystal meth, as you can see, they aged very rapidly. These, uh, this, the the time between this picture and this picture is not that great. The most serious problem in the United States at present seems to be the use of prescription drugs. There is especially a problem with teens using uh, prescription drugs. Uh, the biggest killer among all the addictions is the smoking of tobacco. States are increasing the limits to public smoking. This is what a what your lungs look like uh, when they are when you haven't smoked. This is what they look like with all the tars and nicotines. Uh, this is what they look like. These, these this is from an autopsy, of course. Both of these are are from autopsies. But as you can see, that's a that's a lot of of scarring that has taken place. Uh, the use of performance enhancing drugs, and we're going to talk about this. There's, there is a chapter on performance enhancing drugs. Uh, in sports, has been an issue since the home run race between uh, Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa in 1999. Of course, you don't remember any of these guys, uh, but but I was uh, 
I'm a baseball fan, so I was aware of what was going on. Uh, it is accepted that steroids can cause damage, but new generations of performance enhancers have hit the, the sports scene that do, do questionable damage and are undetectable uh, through drug testing. And, of course, that's the question you have to ask yourself. Um, you can be a successful athlete if you use the steroids. You're not going to be as successful if you don't use the steroids. So do you get juiced? And the answer is it's up, it's up to the individual, I guess. They're illegal, of course. Um, it's illegal for you to use performance-enhancing drugs, especially if you're dealing with the Olympics. Um, there are some sports that, uh, that, that don't condemn it. Uh, but uh, most other sports do. There has been an immense growth of computer games, cell phone usage, and other online problems, such as especially pornography. Uh, with the increase of technology, psychologists have been behind the addiction power curve in identifying problems that people are having. Early man saw his, his world as mysterious and dangerous, and they have a basic need to cope with... Uh, uh, and, of course, they were trying to co cope with their, their environment. Early man discovered that by ingesting certain plants, they could ease their fear and anxiety, reduce pain, uh, treat some illnesses, uh, give them pleasure, and assist them uh, to talk with their gods. <clears throat> the human brain responds to proactive substance, psychoactive substances. When people suffer from mental illnesses or behavioral addictions, the altered state of consciousness uh, makes the individual feel better. Psychoactive substances make the individual feel better, otherwise they wouldn't use them voluntarily. And of course, that's what we're all looking for. I was just talking to my wife about happiness and uh, the fact that uh, that's what everybody is seeking is happiness. Governments, ruling classes, and religious entities have sought to control the supply of drugs through growing, manufacturing, distri distribution, taxing, and prohibition. Ancient Sumerian med medicine men used opium as a secret medicine. The pharaohs of ancient Egypt would dole out beer to keep their uh, laborers building pyramids. Coca leaves were controlled and doled out by the Incan rulers in Peru to maintain the needed laborers in the country they controlled. After the Spanish conquered the Inca, they controlled the growing of coca leaves uh, to increase tax res revenues. The American revolutionaries exported and taxed whiskey and tobacco to help finance the American Revolution. Technology allowed addictive substances to change, improve, and strengthen potencies over the centuries. Alcohol was first distilled to heighten the potency in Arabia in the 10th century. Morphine was first refined from opium in Germany in 1804. Cocaine was first refined from coca leaves in Germany in 1859. What's going on in Germany? <laughs> uh, there were there were a lot of chemists in Germany, so they were they were looking for something new. They were looking for new pharmaceuticals, is what they were looking for. At the time, the scourge of uh, mankind was tuberculosis. Uh, so they were looking for a cure for, for tuberculosis, some pharmaceutical that would destroy the uh, uh, bacteria that caused tuberculosis. And that's one of the reasons why uh, there, there was so much work with pharmaceuticals. An automatic cigarette rolling machine was invented in the United States in, the 18, in 1881. Um, tobacco was fairly endemic all over the United States. Uh, both with men and women. Uh, they chewed it, they smoked it, uh, they used it in pipes, um, and of course um, cigarettes weren't really invented until the, uh, until the late uh, 19th century. So if you're watching a cowboy movie and the, the movie was about uh, the 19, 1870s, 
and the guy smoking a cigarette, uh, probably, uh, maybe, but geez, most people either smoke cigars that, or they smoke pipes or they chew tobacco. A lot of people chew tobacco. The stimulant amphetamine was first synthesized in Germany in 1887 to replace uh, ephedra. It was synthesized in Japan in 1919. Now, why, is, why in the world do they mention both Japan and Germany? And the reason is because during World War II, uh, both the German army and the Japanese army used amphetamines uh, on their, with their soldiers, uh, as did the Allies, the Americans and the, and the British. LSD was first synthesized in Switzerland in uh, 1938. This is the guy that uh, first synthesized it. His name's Hoffman. We're going to see him later on. <clears throat> Since Amelia growing uh, techniques were first used in the United States to increase the THC level of marijuana in the 1960s, the THC content of marijuana is 14 times stronger today than it was in the 1970s. And this is one of the reasons uh, why there is a question as to whether we should legalize it or not. It's so much stronger than it used to be. Uh, a lot of the people that are voting to legalize it are the people that smoked it uh, back in the in the 1960s and 1970s. And, of course, it is so much stronger than it ever has been. And potentially they haven't smoked it since they were teenagers. Um, and, and this is uh, something that, that we need to think about, how strong this stuff is and how intoxicated people get. The amphetamine molecule was first uh, modified to produce designer drugs such as MDMA in the United States in 1910. So ecstasy was first developed in 1910. Faster and more efficient methods of putting drugs into the body has intensified the effects. In 4000 BC, Sumerians mixed opium with alcohol to produce a stronger effect. It was discovered that the absorptive effects of coca leaves could be intensified if the leaf was mixed with charred oyster shells in Peru in 1450. In England in 1800, aficionados discovered that they felt giddy and high from inhaling nitrous oxide, laughing gas. In 1900, Europeans discovered that if they snorted cocaine, they could absorb the drug more quickly. In the United States, users discovered that they could intensify the high of crack cocaine by smoking the rocks in 1970. Within the last decade, users have discovered that they could uh, get a bigger rush from select time-release pain relievers such as OxyContin and Hydrocodone, by crushing the tablets and injecting them directly into the bloodstream. Over 4,000 plants have been identified as yielding psychoactive substances. 60 of these have been, continuous, uh, have been in continuous use somewhere in the world throughout history. Opium poppies, marijuana tops, uh, coca leaves, tea leaves, beetle nuts, cot leaves, uh, coffee beans, tobacco leaves, fruits and other plants that can be used to manufacture alcohol. There is evidence that select groups of Neanderthal in Europe used fly agaric mushrooms to produce hallucinogenic effects for shamanistic rituals. Neanderthal man. Many of the first cultures considered alcoholic beverages, especially wine, as a gift from the gods. The Egyptians uh, had their uh, god Osiris. Uh, Greeks had their god Dionysus. Uh, Romans had their god Bacchus. They were all gods of wine. Uh, the Bible has 150 references to alcohol. Most are warnings against its use. Opium has been cultivated in the civilized world for over 6,000 years. In ancient Egypt, 5,000 years ago, opium was used to treat mental illness and to quiet crying babies. Cannabis sativa has been grown as hemp for thousands of years. The plant has been used mainly for its fiber and manufacturing rope, 
but also for its medicinal and hallucinogenic properties. Now, the reality is that uh, the marijuana plant, uh, cannabis sativa um, and can cannabis indica, uh, come from Asia. It's not an American plant. It's not uh, a European plant. And so it was cultivated in, in Asia uh, and didn't come to the... Uh, uh, and didn't go worldwide until the 18th century, 17th, 18th century. And they used it to make ropes for the navies of the world. Mescal beans, uh, peyote, peyote cacti, and psychedelic mushrooms have been used for their hallucinogenic properties for thousands of years. Mostly used by shaman for, in, uh, for visions, these drugs have been used to, uh, in both North and South America. The psilocybin mushroom uh, was preferred uh, by the Aztecs and the Mayan cultures. Of the 30,000 species of mushrooms in, the, in North and South America, only 80 produce hallucinogens, uh, psilocybin, and psilocin. Tobacco cultivation, the danger of, of, um, of uh, mushrooms is that about half of them are poisonous. Uh, so you have to be really careful. You can eat just any mushroom, and it'll either make you crazy, or it'll either be hallucinogenic, or you can use it as a food. That's not the way it works. Uh, so if you're walking around and you're picking up toadstools thinking that you're going to make yourself a nice stew, or maybe uh, have a good time, uh, you're probably mistaken. Uh, and you may potentially uh, cause uh, cause people to get very, very uh, sick. Some of them are very poisonous. Uh, tobacco cultivation in use dates back 7,000 years in North America. Looking at the sub uh, substance from a survival point of view, its strong alkaloid properties not only make it noxious to herbivores, like deer and buffalo, uh, but uh, it gave it the properties that humans were seeking. And it is these alkaloid properties that makes it so destructive. Archaeological evidence from South America shows that coca leaves have been prized for the, by the indigenous people there for at least 5,000 years. Evidence seems to indicate that they gave it to the dying to ease their journey into the afterlife. Other drugs used by the ancients included uh, members of the nightshade family, uh, Solacanakai, uh, which Solanakai, uh, which contains the chemicals uh, atropine and scopolamine. Uh, during the Dark Ages, people who used these drugs were accused of witchcraft, the medicinal qualities being ascribed to demonic possession or collusion. As a matter of fact, um, <laughs> uh, witches' brooms were theoretically made from uh, um, woody uh, plants of the nightshade family, and the idea was that uh, they would not—they uh, would ride their um, uh, witches' brooms uh, without underwear, so that they were rubbing their uh, their nether regions with this this woody. Uh, stem of this uh, nightshade family, and it was causing them to be become more witch-like or more demonic because they were having these odd um, hallucinations and whatnot. I'm just telling you what they were, what they they thought that was going on with these ladies. Datura, uh, also known as thorn apple, is sometimes made into a salve and absorbed through the skin. Now, potentially, you, this is all over the place, this thorn apple, this datura. Uh, henbane has been used as uh, far back as ancient Egypt, 3,500 years ago. It was used as a painkiller and as a poison. In ceremonies, it was used to induce insanity, which in turn produced hallucinations that resulted in prophecies. Belladonna, which means beautiful woman in Italian, 
is also known as witch's berry and devil's herb. Uh, this uh, drug dilates the pupils, it inebriates the user, and it can cause hallucinations and delirium. If you've ever had an amaryllis plant, that is belladonna. The mandrake is also known as mandra mandragora. Uh, the root of the plant often grows in the shape of a man and was used in ancient, e in ancient Greece to make prophecies. Uh, the drug causes hallucinations and delirium. In the 15th century Italy, it was used as an aphrodisiac. One of the stranger psychoactive drugs is ergot, a uh, brownish purple fungus that causes cereal grain rust, especially on rye, but also on wheat, barley, and triticale. The active ingredient in ergot uh, that causes the, the problems is lysergic acid diethylamide, or better known as LSD. Outbreaks of ergot in Europe in rye growing areas have caused widespread insanity and death. One outbreak in France in, the, in 944 is reputed to have killed 40,000 people. The first written use of caffeine came from the, with the Olmecs uh, 3,500 years ago, who used coca, which is what you make chocolate out of, to produce a stimulating but bitter drink. Tea was cultivated uh, 1,700 years ago in China, and has been used in Eastern Asia ever since. Coffee was first cultivated about 1,200 years ago in Arabia. The invasion of the Americas by the Europeans opened up new markets for psychoactive substances. As the European and American uh, people traded their addictive substances back and forth. Coffee, alcohol, and tea were brought to the Americas and coca and tobacco were taken back to Europe. Ritualized use of stimulants became part of each culture. Opium came back to, to Europe in the form of a medication known as Theriac, which saw opium mixed with from 70 to 100 other medications. Eventually in the 16th century, a stronger version of opium began to be used as a tincture of opium became quite popular. A substance known as laudanum uh, was used for everything from sleep inducer to a painkiller to a treatment for alcoholism. And what is it? It's opium mixed in alcohol. In the early 1600s, a new drink was invented in Holland. It was gin. Because of the contamination of the water supply of Europe, only alcoholic beverages could be drunk with impunity. This new drink was flavorful, easy to make, and inexpensive. It became the drink of choice among the poor in England. Quickly, alcoholism rates and mortality due to drinking skyrocketed in the, skyrocketed in the back alleys of London. England's growing population stopped growing due to the deaths. Attempts to regulate gin production and distribution led to riots. Production rates septupled septupled is multiplied times seven. Finally, in 1751, new laws were passed and gin consumption returned to a less deadly level. Still, control of psychoactive drug use was sporadic throughout the world. Nitrous oxide, also known as laughing gas, inhaling parties were not uncommon in Victorian England. Uh, though the practice sometimes resulted in more fighting than laughing. Morphine was about 10 times as potent as opium. Morphine was used during the Crimean and Civil Wars to treat wounded casualties. Many men became addicted to the painkiller after these wars. Opium became dangerous to life and limb with the development of morphine, but it would get worse. In 1855, the hypodermic needle was invented, making it possible to inject morph morphine. In 1874, morphine was synthesized into diacetyl morphine, or heroin. Heroin uh, was two and sometimes five times stronger than morphine. Opium became involved in one of the oddest events in the history of psychoactive substances. The British were addicted to the caffeine and tea, but the Chinese demanded silver bullion uh, to buy it. 
how the British had no commodity that the Chinese wanted that the Chinese would buy with, uh, with silver. The Chinese had eradicated opium smoking from their country in around 1000 AD. In 1839, the British battled the Chinese to open their ports to the opium, uh, to the opium trade. The Chinese lost the war in 1842. A second opium war was fought from 1856 to 1860 to open more Chinese markets for trade. The Chinese lost again. Trade went from 15 tons in 1800 to 2.5 million tons by the turn of the 20th century. The British had cheap tea and the Chinese had uh, an old addiction, unfortunately. In 1859, cocaine was synthesized from the coca leaf. It quickly became a new medicine. It was used as a topical anesthetic and used for eye surgery. It was mixed with wine to make a new, stronger concoction. It was used by Freud to control asthma, gastric problems, as an aphrodisiac, and to relieve depression. During the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century, many patented medicines were manufactured with what would become illegal drugs. Coca-Cola was first uh, manufactured with 5 milligrams of cocaine and, some, and contain, continues to contain coca extract with the cocaine removed. Coca-Cola continues to be the largest uh, purchaser of Trujillo uh, coca leaf. And of course, that's Coca-Cola. And that's why coca is, is the first part of the, the name of Coca-Cola, because it contained cocaine, and they wanted people to use it, so they were bragging about the fact that they, uh, that they had uh, cocaine in the cola. But all was not paradise in the alcohol-soaked United States. Drunk and high men made poor workers and worse husbands. Inebriation impeded responsibility, and abuse among drinkers was common. The first temperance organization was started in the United States in 1826. To understand why temperance was so widely accepted in the United States, we have to understand that women's lot in the, United, the early 19th century. Contraception was illegal in the United States. It was illegal. You couldn't do anything to keep from getting pregnant. So women tended to be pregnant almost constantly. The drinking pattern in the United States followed the path of cheapest booze. Corn liquor was least expensive, so men tended to drink voluminous amounts of whiskey. Women saddled with a sporting husband were likely to raise their children in poverty and have to accept his drunken abuse. Uh, U.S. consumption of alcohol in 1830 was 7.1 gallons of pure ethanol for each citizen compared to 1.8 gallons today. Now, how, what is pure ethanol? Um, pure ethanol is 200 proof. Uh, there, are rare, there are very few drinks that are, are as strong as, as 100 proof. Uh, some whiskeys, uh, vodka, uh, tequila, some tequilas, most of them are, are below 100. A lot of them are, eight, uh, have, are 80 proof. Uh, wine is what 14 14 proof 14 what is it 14 percent alcohol what would that be 28 proof anyway <laughs> yeah <clears throat> anyway so your beers and your and your wines don't have nearly as much alcohol as as, uh, as spirits do and the spirits of course they don't they're Still uh, less than, than half. Most of them are less than half. Uh, so, but there are some, of course. Everclear is pretty strong stuff. But even Everclear is not 100% alcohol. The first state to prohibit the sale of alcohol was Maine in 1851. By 1855, one-third of the states in the United States had laws controlling the sale and the use of alcohol. Now, you wonder, why in the world would they do this? Come on, why in the world are you doing this? And the answer is, they couldn't make anything. They couldn't manufacture anything. So if you had a state where 
where there was a lot of drinking taking place, then the factories didn't work because the men were too drunk uh, or they were too non-functional or they weren't very functional uh, when they were drunk, weren't drunk. Uh, they were almost impossible to educate. Uh, it was a really ugly situation. So by 1855, one-third of the states in the United States had laws controlling the sale and use of alcohol, and most of these were on the East Coast. Why? Uh, because that's where all the factories were. So which states were not? Well, it would be the southern states, uh, where there were no factories. It would be, uh, yeah, the southern states and the western states. By 1820, I'm sorry, by 1920, enough states, th 33 out of 48, Limited, limited the use of alcohol to lead to the passage of the Volstead Act, prohibiting the manufacture or sale of, uh, of alcohol. Now, we talk about prohibition, and when we talk about prohibition, a lot of people think, well, nobody wanted it. Well, the reality was that 33 out of the 48 states already had it before prohibition was passed, and that's one of the reasons why prohibition passed so readily. But alcohol wasn't the first psycho, and we're going to talk about uh, more about the about prohibition and, and whatnot later. Uh, the alcohol uh, wasn't the first psychoactive substance that was regulated. In 1909, the Opium Exclusion Act was passed, banning the importation of opium into the United States for use other than medicine. In 1914, the Harrison Narcotic Act was passed, labeling opium as a narcotic to be controlled by the federal government. While the Volstead Act was repealed in 1933, other psychoactive substances have been added to the list of controlled substances in the United States. In 1937, the Marijuana Tax Act was passed, banning the use and cultivation of cannabis. In 1965, drug abuse control amendments uh, regulated the manufacture of stimulants and depressants. <laughs> In 1970, the Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act consolidated all the drug legislation so that they would be controlled out of the same office. In 1984, the legal drinking age was raised to 21. Did the Volstead Act work? The answer really all depends on who is answering it. Good things that uh, transpired from prohibition uh, cirrhosis of the liver and other alcohol-related diseases declined dramatically. Uh, domestic violence fell. Uh, violent crime actually fell by two-thirds. Public drunkenness disappeared. Okay, so violent crime went down, domestic violence went down, public drunkenness went down, disappeared, of course, uh, and cirrhosis of the liver declined. So did it work? Well, if you're a medical person, you're going, yeah, probably did work. If you're a local policeman, you're going, yeah, well, you know, domestic violence is down, uh, violent crimes are down, uh, I, I don't have to arrest anybody and throw them in jail for public drunkenness. So, yeah, the local police are going, yeah, it worked really well. The medical people are going, yeah, it worked really well. What the negative things that transpired were directly related to the Volstead Act, increase of organized crime. Organized crime increased, but that didn't really have to do with local uh, law enforcement. It had to do with federal law enforcement. Uh, there was corruption of politicians. Once again, didn't really have to do with the local uh, uh, people. It had to do with the uh, state and uh, large city uh, uh, politicians. Corruption of law enforcement personnel, not really in the small towns. So most law enforcement personnel, uh, rural sheriffs and whatnot, they they didn't, uh, uh, they weren't corrupted. It was the people in the cities that were corrupted. Drinking eventually returned to pre-prohibition levels, but it took 20 years. And since the population had markedly increased, the amount of alcohol consumed was actually lower per person. As we saw before, it was 7.1 gallons. There it is. It was 7.1 gallons in 1830, and today it's only 1.8 gallons of pure alcohol per person in the United States every year. So what's wrong with pot? Hemp was grown in the, United, in the Americas with little problem until it first began to be smoked as a mild hallucinogen 
in Texas in 1910, from whence it spread to the rest of the West. So marijuana wasn't a problem any place except in the West. <clears throat> in the 1930s, the Hearst newspapers ran a propaganda campaign to label marijuana as a narcotic. Part of the complaint with marijuana was that it was being brought into the United States by Mexicans, so it was a way to control the illegal entry of that population. Now, of course, when we're dealing with people west, east of the uh, Mississippi River, they had no problem with marijuana at all because there wasn't any coming into the United States. Uh, but, of course, west of the Mississippi River, there, there's where you have your problem because you have that long border with Mexico. In 1936, 38 states had ban branded marijuana as one of the most dangerous drugs. In 1937, the Marijuana Tax Act was passed, banning the growth of marijuana in the United States. Marijuana was used as a drug only in rural areas where it grew wild and in the back rooms of cities where it was identified with jazz musicians and beat poets. And this is a picture of beat poets. This is, uh, ah, shoot. Uh, I've got a book by this guy. Uh, I can't think of his name. Anyway, these are these are beat poets in New York City. In the 1950s and 1960s, the influence of the beat poets' support uh, of using psychoactive substances, including marijuana as an act of rebellion, caught on with the youth of that era. Um, on the Road by Jack Kerouac was uh, about um, people driving across country and smoking pot and drinking a lot of alcohol, uh, taking drugs. Allen Ginsberg, that's who that guy was. That's Allen Ginsberg. Okay. <laughs> this is Burroughs. Uh, he was another druggy. And you can read their stuff if you want to, but it's all, it, it gets real, it's not very good. On the Road, of course, is one of those great, American novels. Um, I'm not real that happy with it. Catcher in the Rye is supposed to be a, this great novel as well, but I'm not real crazy about that one either. Um, and I was an English major in college. With the beginning of the Vietnam War, the anti-war movement became in, intermingled with uh, youth rebellion, which by this time was connected to marijuana usage. So it got, everything got all wrapped up together. <clears throat> so the federal government was trying to control, they were trying to control the uh, all, all this rebellion that was taking place. And one way they did it was to, to make uh, drugs illegal. Uh, they made all kinds of drugs illegal and they started cracking down on it. Well, who were they really cracking down on? Who, were they, who they were really cracking down on were the, uh, was the youth movement, was the uh, anti-Vietnam movement. And they could do it legally because marijuana and, uh, and other drugs were wrapped into the whole anti-war movement. And so they were able to really crack down on, uh, on what was taking place. Amphetamines were first synthesized in Germany in 1887. Uh, over the years, the substance was used as an inhaler under the name benzedrine and as an appetite suppressant. During World War II, amphetamines were used uh, to combat fatigue by both sides. Uh, my dad um, drove ammunition trucks before the war, and then he joined the, the, the army and went uh, overseas. He was in the uh, European theater. Uh, but he drove uh, ammunition trucks. This is in 1939, 1940. And uh, they would drive from northern Indiana to um, a distribution point in southern Indiana. Uh, that's, that was the, uh, the, the track that they used. And they, they were supposed to drive all night long. And, of course, this was not always easy. They had 12-hour uh, shifts and 18-hour shifts. And the idea was that they were supposed to... Uh, uh, they could use amphetamines to, to keep going. Uh, anytime they wanted, they could, they could uh, uh, take the pills. My dad didn't do it because my dad uh, felt that coffee kept him awake enough. And what coffee actually did, he wasn't very sensitive to caffeine, um, but what it did, it made him have to urinate. <laughs> so he had to concentrate on, on, uh, on his bladder and, and that, that allowed him to stay awake. Anyway, he didn't have any problem with it. He drank coffee to the end of his days. 
and he di and, and he lived to be 90 years old. So, uh, yeah, he didn't take amphetamines during the war or before the war. In the 1950s and 1960s, amphetamines were used in uh, diet pills. Uh, by 1970, it was estimated that 6 to 8% of Americans were using diet pills. Amphetamines were part of the fuel of the hippie movement and the summer of love in 1967. Congress passed the Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act of 1970. And, of course, this was right in the middle of the, uh, of the uh, uh, anti-war movement. And they were trying to crack down on all these hippies and whatnot, all these potheads. Um, and they could just throw them in jail because the Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act of 1970 allowed them to do that. Sports were pretty much the purview of the wealthy and the extremely gifted through the first half of the 20th century. This is uh, Johnny Weissmiller. Uh, it wasn't important enough to try to cheat or gain any advantage. As you can see, he's not all that, that buff. Uh, he's a pretty skinny guy. Uh, he was an a, uh, Olympic swimming champion. With the Cold War after World War II, every field where the free world met the communist world became a battlefield of sorts. The world of sports, especially, uh, especially uh, the Olympics, became a very contentious area of conflict. And so they developed all kinds of interesting performance-enhancing drugs. Eastern Bloc countries led uh, by the example of East Germany began giving their athletes anabolic steroids, creating super-athletes. The world was appalled by the results and came out against the practice in 1968. But remember, the Cold War started in the 1950s, uh, 19, late 1940s, early 1950s. Since then, all amateur athletic organizations have banned the use of steroids, along with the professional athletic organizations around the world. This, is the, this was the world record shot put holder. Uh, as you can see, she, this is a she. Uh, she was a champion. This is what she looks like today. This is what he looks like today. Uh, they gave her so much anabolic steroids, which are male hormones, of course, uh, that uh, it turned her into a, into a male. And today he is a male. Sedatives, and this, this was all done without, without uh, the concept of transgenderism and transsexualism. Uh, this, this all occurred because he took, she took so many um, steroids, uh, and they didn't tell her what they were giving her. Uh, they, were, they were just telling her it would improve her performance. And this is what he looks like today. Sedatives have been used since the beginning of the 20th century in the form of bromides, chloral hydrate, and peraldehyde. Barbitol uh, was marketed as Veronal in 1903. Phenobarbital was developed in 1913. Sedatives became very popular during the Depression and World War II eras, peaking in this time uh, period with over 50 different barbiturates uh, dominating the market. In the 1950s, doctors realized they had not only overprescribed the drugs, but they had created a whole generation of addicted adults from their barbiturates. <clears throat> In the 1950s and 1960s, a whole group of milder tranquilizers were developed to replace the more dangerous tranqu tranquilizers. Milltown and Benzo and the excuse me. Milltown and the benzodiazepines such as Librium, Valium, Xanax, Clonopin, and Halcyon became the most widely used drugs in the world. For the longest time, Valium was the most, most widely used drug in the world, and it was replaced by Prozac. And Prozac was replaced by Viagra, as weird as that may seem. <clears throat> anyway... <laughs> There you go. There's Hoffman, uh, Albert Hoffman. This is what he looks. This this is what he looked like when he first synthesized uh, LSD. Ergot, bar, uh, barley rust, had created havoc wherever it appeared, and no one knew uh, why until 
Uh, Swiss chemist Albert Hoffman isolated the active ingredient lysergic acid diethylamide from the fungus. After his discovery, Hoffman accidentally dosed himself and discovered the psychedelic effects of this substance. The United States Army uh, and the CIA bought the rights to LSD from Hoffman and experimented with the drug through the 50s and into the 60s. Uh, this was called uh, uh, Operation Ultra. That's what they called it. They were, they were thinking that potentially they could spray it over a, 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 an enemy army and they could, uh, they could incapacitate them. Um, never worked. Uh, they tried it in a lot of different, uh, they, they tried it on individuals. They tried it in, a, in um, uh, systems, um, in the air vents of, uh, of public areas. Didn't work, really didn't work. Uh, they had some negative reactions, and because they had so many negative reactions, they decided to dump it. One of the researchers that was working on this uh, with the CIA was Dr. Timothy Leary of Harvard, who decided that the psychedelic substance needed to be shared with the world, and that's how it got out. Before that, it was being it was very much under control, uh, but uh, Timothy Leary uh, dosed himself by mistake realized that this is something that uh, that everybody he thought everybody should use it uh, and uh, he gave it to the rest of the world 1.5 billion people drink alcohol around the world 76 million of these people have an alcohol abuse disorder including this guy right here 180 million people worldwide abuse illicit drugs 160 million people worldwide smoke marijuana each year. Each year, you can see how large that that blunt is. It has been estimated that 20 to 60 percent of all hospital beds are inhabited uh, due to drug abuse, which is really irritating for those of us working in medicine. Illicit drugs figure into the economic, economic structure both where they are grown and where they are used. This includes heroin, cocaine, marijuana, MDMA, which is actually a chemical uh, process, and methamphetamine, which is also a chemical process. Illegal heroin uh, is grown in four areas of the world. Uh, the Golden Crescent is an area in Southwest Asia that encompasses areas of Afghanistan, Iran and Pakistan. And this is one of the things that we were trying to control when we were in Afghanistan and we failed miserably. The Golden Triangle encompasses parts of Southeast Asia countries of Thailand, Myanmar, which used to be called Burma, and Laos. Mexico exports a form of heroin that is dark in color and called black tar or brown heroin. Colombia not only exports cocaine to the United States, but a white heroin as well. White heroin found in the Golden Triangle, Golden Crescent, and Colombia is a purer, stronger heroin than black tar or brown heroin. 90% of the world's supply of illicit heroin comes from the poppy fields of Afghanistan. 60% of Afghanistan's wealth comes from opium sales, and the United States' efforts to curb production has resulted in an increase by 50%. Bismal failure. The nationalist Chinese under Chiang Kai-shek and his Kuomintang party dealt with the drug uh, tongs of Shanghai while they controlled China. This was until the uh, Communist Revolution in the uh, late... Uh, uh, 1940s. After the Kuomintang were expelled from China, they continued to grow and market opium along the Thai-Burma border in order to buy weapons for their defense against the communists. The Vietnam War was a quagmire. Not only was the war being fought in the Golden Triangle, but the United States allied itself with some of the most notorious drug smugglers in the area, the Hmong. And if you've ever seen the movie uh, Gran Torino, uh, it's about the Hmong population that immigrated from uh, the mountains of uh, Southeast Asia. The Hmong were excellent allies against the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong as they moved freely through Thailand, Laos, and Vietnam and fought the communist soldiers who encroached in their area. 
They hated the communists. They hated the North Vietnamese, and there was a reason why they hated the North Vietnamese. These are the indigenous peoples of that south, of Southeast Asia. Uh, the uh, North Vietnamese were mostly of Chinese descent. In other words, they were a different ethnic group. And because of that, because, because a group had moved in and tried to, to displace all the indigenous peoples uh, of Southeast Asia, uh, the the uh, indigenous peoples were were blood enemies uh, to to those Chinese people uh, or Chinese immigrants, and we're talking about fifteen twenty generations back. But we're, they're still um, uh, genetically uh, her, their heredity is Chinese, and the Hmong don't accept them. Now, if you look at uh, the the people in the movie Gran Torino are actually Hmong people. Uh, so you can see that they don't look anything like the Chinese. They look very, very different from uh, people who are, are uh, indigenous or, or, or are Chinese. Cocaine doesn't grow just anywhere. Cocaine grows mainly in the humid mountain valleys of Colombia, Peru, and Bolivia. Cocaine has been at the forefront of the political problem in Colombia for over half a century. Drug cartels operate with impunity throughout the country and control many of the decisions being made locally and nationally. Worldwide, 25 million, uh, that's the size of Texas plus Montana, uh, 25 million people have died from AIDS, and another 40 million, that's the, the if you put California and Oregon together, are infected with HIV. In the United States, around 900,000, that's the population of Montana, uh, uh, people are infected with HIV, while 500,000 uh, have died of AIDS. That's about the size of the population of Seattle. When the AIDS epidemic first hit in 1982 and 1983, it was mostly caused by unsafe sex between homosexual males. But in time, it spread into the intravenous drug-injecting population, and now it is more likely to be contracted by sharing contaminated needles than any other cause. Hepatitis C is a liver infection that infects 4 million uh, people in, uh, in the United States. Uh, 4 million, that's the size of the population of Los Angeles. Uh, if you look at the Los Angeles Metroplex, uh, there's about 17 million people that live there. But Los Angeles proper is right in the middle, and it has 4 million people. 85 to 90 percent of all intravenous drug users are infected with, H, uh, with HCV, mostly from sharing needles. That's hepatitis C uh, virus. Um, we now have a medication to treat HCV. For the longest time, we didn't. There was no way to, to deal with it. Uh, and people would, we knew that people were going to die with it because there was nothing we could do. Club drugs, ever since the Roaring Twenties, people have been mixing the coolest of music with psychoactive drugs. In the Twenties, it was jazz mixed with cocaine and bootleg liquor. The women were called flappers and the men were referred to as jazzbos. There's a jazzbo right there. She's not really, a, doesn't look like much of a flapper. Uh, flappers wore straight dresses. Uh, they bound their their chest uh, to look flat. They wore bobbed hair, hair uh, cuts, um, and they wore rolled up stockings, and that's what a jazz bow looked like. <clears throat> uh, bootleg lick, bootleg liquor, cocaine, and jazz. <sighs> In the 50, 1950s, the music was the blues. The psychoactive drugs were heroin and whiskey. The men and women were either called beats or beatniks. Uh, if you see a movie from the 1950s, sometimes people will, they're dressed in black and they, they wear dark glasses inside. And uh, <clears throat> I don't know, they, they act cool all the time. They may, the men may have uh, goatees or beards or, or whatever. And these are, these are the beatniks. In the 1960s and 1970s, the music became hard rock. The psychoactive drugs that fueled the music were LSD, speed, 
marijuana and wine, and the people were hippies and the women were chicks. As we drifted into the new millennium, the music became techno or electronic trance music. The psychoactive drugs that fueled the craze were MDMA, marijuana, nitrous oxide, ketamine, GHB, and beer. Uh, the participants are referred to as ravers. And there you go, all these ravers. Marijuana continues to, to create controversy. Legalized in many states for medicinal purposes, people are required to have a, a prescription for its use. Uh, marijuana is, is Recreational marijuana is legal in 21 states. It's legal or it, uh, it can be used for medicinal purposes in 39 states. Marijuana continues to be the most widely used illegal drug throughout much of the world, including the United States, Canada, Australia, Mexico, and South Africa. <clears throat> the destructive effects of tobacco have prompted many countries to try to curb its use. Cuba banned uh, smoking in public places. Ireland has banned smoking in pubs. In many states, uh, in the United States, smoking is banned in any public area, and this, of course, includes Iowa, uh, Illinois, Arizona, and Montana. As late as 1966, almost half the population smoked regularly, about 42.6%. By 2005, the percentage of regular smokers in the United States had declined to less than one quarter of the, the adult population, 22.5%. This decline had much to do with the discovery that cigarettes contained many carcinogens that caused disturbing medical problems. 1,178 people die every day from the effects of smoking. A study in England showed that smoking can reduce life expectancy by 10 years. Despite the reduction, and what do we have here? We have a, a person who will become president of the United States giving away Chesterfield cigarettes as Christmas presents so that people will have the merriest of Christmases. Despite the reduction of revenue for tobacco companies in the United States, they have been able to, to keep profits up by developing foreign markets in the third world. In the United States, tobacco manufacturers have tried to sustain their market by targeting females, minorities, and younger smokers. In 1998, tobacco companies agreed to pay $246 billion over 25 years for their illicit practices in the past. And that runs out this year. So, wow. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Worldwide, 33 million people use amphetamines or similar stimulant substances. In the United States, 16,000 meth labs were raided in 2004. However, meth labs have been partially controlled by controlling the precursor uh, chemicals ephedrine and pseudoephedrine found in common cold remedies. Now, the odd thing about ephedrine and pseudoephedrine is that it only works on about 11% of the population, but they still put it in cold capsules because for that 11%, it actually works. But for everybody else, it doesn't work. Total, uh, this is in 2014. There were a total of 9,338 uh, meth labs that were uh, broken up and the state, the largest state at that time was Indiana, had the most meth labs. And Missouri was second, I think. Yeah, there you go. Arizona and New Mexico. Eh, not so much. Treatment for amphetamine usage was, has skyrocketed in the, in the past decade. I, and, I, and I looked for more, more information on this. I couldn't find any more. So, uh, yeah, there we go, Tennessee. This, this whole area right here looks to be a problem. Real popular. Methamphetamines are real popular here. Treatment for amphetamine usage has skyrocketed in the past decade. In 1993, only 21,000 people sought treatment for amphetamine addiction. This figure had increased to 151,000 by 2004. Other stimulants also make an impact on our lives. The use of caffeine is, in recent years has increased markedly. Coffee kiosks have sprung, sprung up in tiny towns, and sales of caffeinated soft and energy drinks have exploded. 
18% of the teens, 4,300,000, abused Vicodin in the form of hydrocodone in 2004. Hydrocodone is the most widely used and abused prescription opiate. 10%, 2,300,000 teens, abused the opiate Percodan in the form of OxyContin, the time-released versions of uh, Oxycodone. And as you can see, the, the drugs make you sexy. <laughs> Alcohol directly kills 75,000 people in the United States every year. Alcohol directly kills 1.8 million people worldwide every year. 17.6 million Americans have an alcohol abuse disorder. That is 8.5 of the, the adult population. Alcoholics make up 10 to 15 percent of people in hospitals, 10 to 20 percent of people in nursing homes. When MRIs were done on gamblers, uh, the portions of the brain that were activated by winning and losing were the same areas that were activated by cocaine. Statistics show that 2.5 million Americans are classified as pathological gamblers. 3 million Americans are classified as problem, problem gamblers. 15 million Americans are at risk for problem gambling. This is gambling we're talking about. We're not even talking about gaming. One study in Minnesota in 2004 found that 1% of the gamblers accounted for 50% of the wagers. In the same year, among the riverboats of Illinois, 10% of the gamblers accounted for 80% of the revenues. While gambling may be the most economically devastating behavioral addiction, there are others that are equally personally devastating. Compulsive overeating, anorexia, bulimia, internet addiction, sexual addiction, excessive TV addiction, compulsive shopping, pornography addiction. And that is the end of the chapter. So I'll talk to you guys next week. We'll tackle chapter two, as much fun as that will be.